Hey, good afternoon everybody. Today I'm going to show you how to make potato and cheese buns. Now, I did some research for this. This is not really my recipe. Um, I went quite far east of here for this, namely to Turkey. And there's a famous dish there called, and I hope I'm saying this right, Pogacha Tafiri, uh, which are these really beautiful soft buns stuffed with melted cheese, right? Now, I did a bit more research and found out that you can use any kind of filling. So today, I've got uh, some white potatoes and some provolone. This works really well with any kind of melty cheese if you haven't got provolone. Uh, another excellent alternative, if you can get your hands on it, is Friulano. Uh, and if not, mozzarella, you know. Anyways, so there's two components to this. There's the dough. And ideally, if you have a stand mixer, uh, you want to use this because doing this by hand is a lot of work. The dough is very sticky and if you're going to knead it by hand, you will have to oil your hands first and ideally probably with a kitchen glove. So I'm going to get going on the dough component and I'm going to do the filling while the dough is rising. So here's the ingredients for both parts the dough, and the filling, and as I said, you can change this up, you know, if you don't want to use potatoes, you can think of something else, you can leave it out, put more onions whatever you want, right? I even tried one experiment with leftover pot roast and I just chopped up everything. Like the, the meat, the carrots, the potatoes and just stuffed them in and it worked great. Okay, the dough is re the real magic to this recipe and I'll get that going now. First part for the dough is to get um, the vehicle for the yeast started. So I've got one cup of whole milk in here I've got a third of a cup of butter pre-measured or 80 grams if you want to go metric close enough okay so just put that in here yeah and the butter is very well behaved today because it's minus 26 centigrade outside today if I ever want to make these and freeze them I just put a tray on the back porch and I'm done and the oil now I do this in the microwave you can do it on the stove if you want um, if you're going to do it on the stove, you're probably going to want to scald the milk and let it cool down to the right temperature. I find the microwave faster, uh, and I just do it in short bursts. All right, that's looking good. Sides are for the bowl are warm, but not too hot. Now, you do have to test this with a clean finger, gloved or not. If it's just nice and warm, you're ready to go. If it's too hot to your finger, the yeast is going to die. So first the sugar, stir that up a bit. If you don't have a jar of yeast and you're using pockets, um, you're not going to need the whole pocket. It'll be too yeasty. So what you should do is either stick, pour, the measure, pour it from the pocket into the measuring spoon or stick the pocket in. It's probably about three quarters of a pocket if you want to eyeball it. I use the Active Dry Yeast for this. So I'll just set that aside briefly and prepare the eggs and the flour. If you're wondering why I've got two glass dishes, it's not just because I want to put one egg in each one, okay? You're going to need one and a half eggs, like one egg and a white and a yolk for the glaze. So just get two little bowls. And it's really interesting, when you crack two eggs together, only one of them breaks. So, you can hold one in one hand, and there's your one egg, and either keep the shells if you've got a clean break to use to separate, and then this you're going to have to crack on the other bowl, and let the white drop out, okay. And you can just dump that in quick. The reason I don't do it directly over the other bowl is in case the yolk breaks like that, which you want in here anyways. And to this, 
you're just going to drop, put a couple of bits, maybe a teaspoon of oil and a teaspoon of milk. I do it directly from the container. If you want to get a teaspoon, that's great. It doesn't really matter for this. If you've got a little bit more glaze, it's all right. So I'm going to put both of these in the fridge for now. I haven't turned on the oven yet, so I can put the flour container on there. And I leave a nice big spoon in there, because I just like to do it like this, measure it in the cup. So there's two. You don't have to be super precise about this, because depending on your elevation, depending on the humidity, depending on a whole bunch of factors, you may need a little bit more flour, or milk, or something. But it usually works if you just eyeball it. Sprinkle on the salt. If you have a dough hook, attach it. And just give it a brief stir. When the milk is starting to look like something you've discovered at the back of the fridge, um, that means the yeast has risen enough that you can put it in. You don't have to get fussy about this part, that's what I love about it. Just be careful and toss all of that in at once. And the one and a half eggs. Start this on low because if you go high right away, flour will like jump up out of the bowl. So you want to do it slow to break up the stuff. Then you can nudge it up one. Whoops, see, that's what I mean. It just pops right out of the bowl. Yeah, this is a really stiff dough at the beginning. You can hear the sound of the motor changing. So, when it has reached that point, what you can do is you can stop it. Oh, it's a little too wet to touch it, so we'll go a bit more. Yeah, even just stopping it will let it fall down enough that it picks up stuff from the bottom, which is what I had wanted it to do. So you can do that again, just stop it. You can see it sliding down there, because it's heavy. And once it's slid down enough, now you turn it up. Take a look at your clock if you've got one. I've got one close to me. And then, this is like rodeo time, okay? You're going to have to hang on to your mixer. I don't put it up past medium because you can see it's kind of like getting crazy and it's hard on the motor. That slapping noise is really good for developing the dough. About halfway through, what you can do is unlock it. You can turn it off and pull the dough down like that. That will help up, help to pick up any sticky bits on the bottom and go again. I'll just slow it right down, try to jam the camera in there. If you can see, the bottom of the bowl is clean, which is kind of awesome. And we are at full time. And you can see that, yeah, there's no flour, there's no nothing. Great. Pour a little bit of oil in the bottom. There's a fair amount of oil in this recipe, so you don't have to worry if you put a little too much. Get your dough out of the beautiful container. And roll that in the oil. Press it down. Cover it with some plastic wrap and let it rise for an hour at least. Next step is get your filling ready while the dough is rising. I've got my 500 grams or a pound and a bit of potatoes and I'm just going to give them a quick rinse. 
check them over, peel off any suspicious looking bits. Not too many on these, they're fairly nice. First, I cut them in half because A, it cooks quicker, and you can also tell if, oh, surprise, did you get a bad potato? No. Try to do them fairly evenly, so I've got three little ones here, and a fairly larger one, so I'm going to cut this one in three pieces, so it's sort of the same size as the others. Give them a quick rinse again, and then just go cover it with a plate and pop it in the microwave. Now, the eternal question, how long to cook them? The answer, till they're done. Um, but, <laughs> seriously folks, if you've got a baked potato setting on your microwave, which I do, I have found the easiest way to do this is just set it for two baked potatoes. Um, I'm not sure the power level it uses, but it works out to about seven and a half minutes for this much. And again, microwaves will vary. Now while this may seem self-evident to experienced cooks, I am uh, actually teaching for inexperienced cooks. And a good rule of thumb when you're preparing a filling, while you're waiting on dough or anything, is do the stuff that takes the longest first. So the potatoes take the longest because they have to cook, and then they have to cool down a bit, and then I've got to take the skins off, right? So while I'm doing that, I'm going to chop the onion and shallots and get that frying so when that's on the stove then when the potatoes are out I can deal with them and shredding the cheese will not take very long at all. So as usual just cut the ends off. If you've got if you've got beautiful onions and you want to peel them like that you can. If you've got dark pieces that are not going to be very good no matter what you don't want if you're making beautiful buns you don't want a piece of tough onion in it just peel the first layer off that one looked a bit sketchy to start off with give them a quick chop This is all going in the frying pan at the same time, so I'll just spin the cutting board and do the shallots on the other side. Now, depending on where you are and what time of the year it is, um, we're between Christmas and New Year's now. We just passed the peak for shallots. I mean, these things are nearly the size of footballs. They're gorgeous. Um, when you get into summer months, they'll shrink and they won't be so nice. What I do at this time of year, I usually buy a whole bunch and I'll do them in the dehydrator. If you live in a warm place, you can just pop them outside with a cheesecloth over uh, a baking sheet so the bugs don't get to them. And last resort, if you have neither option, is you can always spread them out on a baking sheet and do them on low heat in the oven. And then take the dry bits. After you slice them, obviously, you're going to slice these first. And then do them on a baking sheet. And then take them out and just put them in a little jar. And then you can chop them up or grind them as the seasoning and sauces. They're wonderful. So once these are peeled, do them like onions. But these I just do in little strips first. And to leave a little character in your filling. A coarse chop on these comes out quite nice. So those I'll just heap up with the onions here. Now the garlic is optional. If you don't like garlic, don't put it in. But since I love garlic and I'm eating these, I'm putting it in. Yeah. You don't want to overpower the dish. So one or two cloves are sufficient. Quick smash the peels should come right off either in one piece or very easily do not put the garlic paper on the outside down your garburetor you will get a very bad surprise <laughs> in a few months and you will have to get one of those sink snakes and it's a very unpleasant enterprise 
unplugging your sink with a block garbage, okay? Trust me. Just put them in the garbage or the recycling or the compost or whatever you do where you are. Now for this, I'll put about a teaspoon each of oil and butter so the butter doesn't burn. You don't want these too greasy because there's a lot of cheese in it. See, the potatoes just went off, so it's good timing. You can toss the onions and shallots right in before the butter melts even. It is not going to be a problem. Now, what I usually do is spread that out a little bit and put the garlic out on top. If you put the garlic in first on a hot pan, it will burn and have an unpleasant odor. So you want to kind of layer that and just let that start going by itself over medium heat. That, that plate's not part of the recipe, I just put my tongs on that. So now that it's sizzled up a little bit, you can mix in your garlic if you've got any. And also, this is optional. That needs a chop, doesn't it? That's the piece of shallot that got away. You can toss a little salt in here. If you are going to use the dill weed, I love that in this combo. Uh, put it in after when it's cold. Don't put it in with the onions. And just a warning, I do do this very carefully. Either get gloves for the plate or the bowl because it can be like really hot. Okay, look at that. See? The knife just went in. All the pieces are done. And if the biggest pieces are doing this, then the little ones are doing it for sure. Now, so the real question is, is how to proceed at this minute because they'll burn your fingers off. Just bring it over to the sink. Trust me on this. Fill the bowl up with water. Now you can touch the pieces. So what I'm going to do is I'll just grab the smallest one because the large ones can still be, have some fair amount of inner warmth. And if you got a piece that you got to cut, just get your knife under there. And peel the skin off. Try not to take off too much of the flesh. There is a reason I'm putting it back in the water. You'll see at the end. If it gets too hot, just put the potato back in the water. Because you don't want to be dropping these or throwing them. Lovely. Put all the potatoes back in the water. Now, after I've done one, they're still feeling pretty warm, so I'm going to just empty the water with my hand over it and put more cold water. Changing the water once is usually sufficient. Once you've peeled all of them, just get your cutting board back over. It's got a bit of onion on it. doesn't matter. Pull out your potato pieces and just put them there to dry off for a minute. If you've done this fairly quickly there is still enough residual heat that the potato will nearly dry off because you don't want too much water in here. You want a little bit but you don't want them soggy which is why I do them in the microwave. And then you just pull all the peels out of the water. Get a strong fork with thick tines. One reason I like yellow potatoes is they cook really nicely in the microwave and they fluff up too. They're nearly crystalline. Now, potatoes, like other things, they're not all equal. And here's an example here. Well, I probably could mash this, but I want to just show you what I mean. If you've got a hard bit that hasn't boiled properly, don't ruin your dish. Just take it out. That's definitely looking pretty good. So I turn the heat right down on this while I get the cheese grated. You can definitely use a coarse grate for this. Now, grate the cheese however you want. I kind of peel back part of the plastic because that way I don't have to touch it and it's more hygienic. 
And if the piece does break, which it did, you got clean hands, that's fine. Just don't grate your fingers into the mix. Be very careful at the end. Your cheese grater is going to get full. Okay, so you don't want to keep grating until it's all jammed up in a solid mass. Pull it up, tap it, move it over, or move the grater, and start again. And there's the rest of it. Nothing inside. Great. Oh, bad joke. Great. Now, if I was doing a sauce, I'd deglaze the dish, but I don't want to add any liquid to the filling. So we'll stop now. I likely could get away with doing it all in here, but it would be really cramped. Pop the potatoes in here. Now is when you add your dill. If you feel you need extra seasonings, like more salt, depending on your taste buds, you can do that. I'm going to put in a dash of black pepper instead of more salt, because that's nice too. Put in the onion mixture. Grab the grated cheese by handfuls, put it over the top, and gently start mixing it in like that. The potatoes are cool, the onions are hot. As soon as you start mixing it, they'll cool right down, and it's just a nice temperature for the cheese to melt right into the mixture. Continue like that until you're done. That's looking fine. Um, it still has at least 20 minutes to go, probably half an hour. Um, I am going to start heating up the oven now, so this is definitely coming off the stove top. It will be risen enough to work with by then. So preheat your oven to 425 and get two baking sheets prepared. I don't know how you want to do yours. I just used some parchment on mine. I generally don't trim my parchment. Uh, the reason I do for this recipe is if you've got it hanging over the edges of your cookie sheet like that, at 425, if it hits the side of the oven, yes, it will catch fire and possibly set off your smoke alarm. So what I do is I just pull out enough till I've got just enough, tear it off, I'm getting near the end of the roll here, so if you have a rolling issue, turn it over. Now line up one side against the side of the pan, fold the other side over, you don't have to be actually super precise about this just enough that it stays put and I just tear off the unwanted bit and that's how you'll prevent smoking fires in your oven. I got everything set up. Now obviously you're not going to make your buns with your dough on the baking sheet but I'm only going to show you a couple and this is the best angle to do it from. So get your gloves on. If you don't have kitchen gloves, yes, you will have to oil your hands. Now, depending on the composition of your dough, and is that not, let me just pop that up. Is that not lovely? Look at that, eh? So what you're going to do is you're going to pull up let me get this in here. You're going to pull up a piece like that. And you're going to just kind of tear it off. Now, depending on how sticky your dough is, you may need to oil your hands. I'm just going to try to come back around here and not get in the, get the shadow on the scene. So what you want to do is just pull on your dough like this about even spread it out on your palm like that okay and like I said depending on on how your dough went humidity and whatnot if it's sticking badly to your glove yes just dab a little oil these can always use a little oil it won't hurt them and from this angle so you can see it I'm gonna grab about just a handful 
like that. Sort of shape it like a bit like a canal, not exactly, but a little oval. And come back over here, squeeze it in so it doesn't come out the edges. Then pull one side up till it touches the other. Then squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it. You don't want to get any water for this, just use the natural stickiness of the dough and pinch them nicely together. If you miss any bits, yes it will ooze out cheese and potato onto the baking sheet and it kind of gets toasty and yummy so if you have one of those accents you can just eat those pieces, don't tell anybody. Okay, and then you want to kind of fold it up over so you don't have any leakage accidents. Turn it over, bend it, so it's a nice little loaf flatten it, place it on the baking sheet, and I'll show you one more. Oops, okay, hopefully knocking the camera over. Okay, so, pull, flatten it, stretch it, it's just wonderful though. When you're ready, just grab a handful out of the bowl like that. Now, for whatever reason, the dough starts acting up and you have to go for it from another side. No problem. Pinch. Push. Like little clamshells. or pierogies, pierog baked. See all food is the same actually in the end. It's just what how you put it together and what they call it and where it's from and so on. But Okay so there's two good ones. I'm just going to turn off the camera and make the rest. I'm down to the last two and you'll see there's a bit of a conundrum here. Oh my god, these ones are bigger than these ones. I did this on purpose because I wanted to show you that yes, you will get in a situation like this when you're making these things. Nothing is perfect. So what you're going to do is put them in the oven at the same time. I will glaze them first. But put them in the oven at the same time. And um, just simply take the small ones out first. Keep an eye on them, and if the large ones have to bake another couple of minutes till they look the same doneness, that's fine. This one looks small, so we'll put that one over here and pull that one there. And that one looks kind of smallish too, so that one will come here, and we're fine. Now it's just time to glaze them and bake them. It's been in the fridge the whole time. Mixed it up briefly with um, either a pastry brush like I have it will get a little fluffy because it's been in the fridge if you don't have one just a clean couple of fingers mix it up with a finger and just dab some on like this with two clean fingers and you're fine but don't think that oh my goodness I can't make this recipe because I don't have a pastry brush for now, I'm going to pop these in my 425 oven uh, for at least 14 minutes. Yes, I will set a timer, and I'll take a look at them then. If the bigger ones need a couple of minutes, then just let them go. So the timer's gone off. Let's see where we are. Yeah, the small ones are beautiful. Okay. Let's take the large ones, and you know what, they're looking pretty fine too, so I'll just take those out. Now this is what I was talking about here, if one of them leaked, uh, you got the cheese and potato all over the baking sheet, but hey, you know, that's sort of like a, a, a treat for the baker after. So I'm going to let these cool off because there's no way you can eat these when they're this hot. Um, first of all, you'll burn your mouth and they won't taste very good either. 
I do want to show you what the filling looks like and these two look like they're stuck together so I'll just sacrifice one of those so they're kind of stuck together. I've got them both on a plate so there's one cut open on the plate and just for you to see see how soft that dough is it's just wonderful and all the cheese is nice like I said it's still too hot to eat but you can see how nice and melty all the cheese and potato filling is and the inner dough is kind of flaky and nice and soft so these are a bit of work to make I'll admit that uh, but they freeze really well and they're great to bring for lunches at work and such and maybe school uh, so anyways there's my potato cheese buns thank you for watching and I do hope you give these a try because they're really good okay see you again if you like my stuff subscribe